Uh, welcome to my coronavirus video. We're going to try to learn some things about coronavirus together as we go along. And uh, to do that, we have to start by identifying some terms. So we're going to go through coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, and COVID-19 and see what say what each of these means. So coronavirus is actually the family of viruses that our current uh, pandemic is being caused by. And why it's called coronavirus is because these viruses all have an envelope and this envelope is studded with little proteins that make them kind of look like a crown. So that's where it got its name from. Now our current virus is called SARS-CoV-2 and that's the name of the actual virus. Now what does SARS stand for? It stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome uh, Coronavirus 2. Okay, And um, this is a useful name because the respiratory complications of this virus are the main cause of its lethality and how it ends up actually harming people or killing them in this case. And so this virus is causing a disease caused called COVID-19. Okay, so COVID-19 is the name of the disease caused by the virus. And what does this stand for? It stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. And this is a mainly respiratory disease. And um, this concept of naming the virus and the disease differently is similar to how we have HIV and AIDS, where HIV is the name of the virus and AIDS is the name of the syndrome associated with the virus. So similar concept here, SARS-CoV-2 is our virus, COVID-19 is our disease. Let's go through the structure of our coronavirus and uh, how it replicates. And by understanding that, we can kind of understand how to combat this virus um, and what kind of drugs are in the works for it. So here's our coronavirus. Here's our main structures we're looking at. See this red circle around it? This is our uh, phospholipid envelope. And then we have these pink structures and green and blue. These are our envelope proteins. So essentially what these do is they help the virus integrate into your own cells and then help it replicate. And inside, here's our uh, single-stranded RNA. It's a positive single-stranded RNA. And you'll see that it's kind of in a loop structure and that's because it has a helical nucleocapsid. That's another property of this virus. So how does this virus replicate? There's a graphical representation here on the left but and it's a little bit complicated but so I've uh, simplified it over here on the right. So our virus comes into contact with your cell okay and it has these spike proteins which are these hoof looking things and they attach to our receptor on the cell and in this case we have an ACE2 receptor which is here in blue. The majority of these receptors are actually found in your lungs. So if the SARS virus comes and interacts with a lung surface protein, it's going to integrate a lot easier because it has these receptors. So that's why uh, it mainly affects our respiratory system. A lot of these receptors are in the respiratory tract. All right, so once the virus enters, it essentially uh, shoots out its positive single-stranded RNA. And that's represented by our red structure here. Then the ribosome is going to take that and it's going to translate it and make our protein, which is viral polymerase or RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So let's switch over to this diagram and you can use this one on the left for reference if you wanna follow along, but it's a lot easier if I just go through stepwise. So our virus came in and shot it, essentially its genome into the cell. That's our positive single-stranded RNA. Then it's going to use our cell's own ribosomes to make the first protein, which is our RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which we're gonna call RDRP. All right, so now RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, what it does is it goes back to this positive single-stranded RNA and it transcribes it. So we now have positive single-stranded RNA getting converted into its complement, which is negative single-stranded RNA. Now that's important because our negative single-stranded RNA is what encodes our, all of our viral coat proteins. So these are the E protein you saw here, the nucleocapsid, the hemagglutinin esterase, the envelope, everything, okay? So we need this to replicate our virus because our virus is essentially made of two things, the viral genome and the viral proteins, all right? So now we've made the viral protein section, but we still need to make more of this positive single-stranded RNA to complete our virus. So what RNA-dependent RNA polymerase does is it's very clever. It can make positive to negative, and it can also go back and make negative to positive. So it can turn this back into its complement, which is positive, and there we go, we've made more viral genome. And now these two sections combine, essentially, and we have more SARS-CoV-2, and that virus gets shot out to infect more cells. And here it's a little bit uh, more complicated because we have the ER and the Golgi and how the nucleocapsid is made, but if you're uh, higher level in terms of your 
biology knowledge, you can refer to this diagram. It's essentially what I've done here, but a little more uh, clean, and a little more complicated. So how do we disrupt this process? Um, there's two ways of doing it so far. Uh, none of these are in current treatment regimens yet, but let's discuss them anyway. So there's the viral, antiviral called remdesivir, and this is an ATP analog. So if anyone studied genomics, you'd know that you have these uh, nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, right? And A and T are complementary, and C and G are complementary. And in RNA, instead of T, we have a U. So what remdesivir does is it essentially mimics A. So whenever this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase encounters an A or a U, it's going to want to incorporate A. But instead of that, it incorporates remdesivir. And remdesivir essentially gets in there and jams up the process and no more replication of this um, RNA, either forwards or backwards, right? So that's one way that's in development. And I think the drug is currently in phase one trials are completed and they will be going into phase two and three. So about a year from now, uh, we'll know if this works. And in the meantime, there's also a vaccine that's being developed based on the RNA of the virus. And we'll discuss that maybe in another video. Another way that's been hypothesized to stop this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in some studies is zinc. But the only problem about using zinc to stop this is that you need high quantities of zinc. And in the studies, they artificially introduced more zinc uh, into the cell by making the membrane more permeable. So it's really kind of a question whether zinc is really all that helpful. But if you're paranoid, zinc is water soluble. So you can take, a cup, you can take your daily zinc multivitamin if you want to, and it can't hurt. Just make sure not to take too, too much because there are all multiple vitamins in there and you can overdose on certain ones. But zinc is water soluble, so it's relatively safe. You'll just pee it out if you take too much. All right, so let's talk about vitamin D. Um, vitamin D, what it does is it's an immune modulator. So that means it makes the immune system react appropriately to certain threats, for example, in this case, viruses. So if you have a virus, you don't want your immune system going too crazy because the inflammation in your lungs, in this case, will be too much for you to handle and the fluid builds up and oxygen exchange doesn't happen and eventually that's how you die. So it essentially modulates the response and keeps it appropriate for the virus. And I, if you've watched the news, uh, Donald Trump I think mentioned that the virus tends to wane in the summertime. That's at least a hypothesis that's being put out there. And the reason for that is people be going, are going outside, are in less enclosed spaces, less likely to transmit it. And also, uh, vitamin D has been hypothesized to play a role in that. And let's go over to our last little defense over here, and that's our alcohol. So, uh, coronavirus can be killed by alcohol in high temperatures, right? And then we have our meme here, of corona, killing corona. So, what's, what's going on is that our virus is surrounded by this envelope, right? And this envelope can be destabilized in two ways by either alcohol or heat. And if the envelope doesn't work, the virus essentially is um, incapacitated and can no longer infect because the envelope has all of our proteins that it needs to replicate and integrate into our cells. Let's cover a bit of the epidemiology behind SARS-CoV-2. So as of March 20th, 2020, when I'm recording this, um, China has 80,000 plus confirmed cases. And here are all the other countries with over a thousand confirmed cases. And as you can see, uh, out of these people, not that many people are dying. So the death percentage, the case fatality rate is around two to four percent. And most of the people who are dying are elderly and have comorbid conditions, uh, diabetes, chronic heart disease, um, other lung conditions, COPD, things like that. Um, actually, interestingly enough, children under the age of 15, there have been really no detected cases and zero fatalities, uh, which means that in, in the young population, this disease is for the most part subclinical and they are probably mainly just acting as vectors in the spread. An important value to understand here is something called the r naught. So what that means is if one person gets the disease uh, or the virus, how many people will they spread it to before it resolves in that person? So for SARS-CoV-2, it's around two to three. I know here it says 1.4 to 2.5, but most papers that I've seen have an estimate around two to three. And the case fatality is four. If we compare this with the previous uh, coronavirus pandemics, SARS and MERS, 
we can see that their case fatalities were a lot higher. And uh, SARS in 2003 had a similar R0 value, right? So why was SARS in 2003 not as um, big of a deal in the news media as our current pandemic? Well, uh, in total, it had 8,000 to 10,000 confirmed cases, which is quite low. So that means it was probably caught very early on, right? And especially with this higher fatality rate, it was probably more concerning earlier on. And right now, if we compare the eight to 10,000 cases of the original SARS uh, to our 80,000 just in China, you can see that that's why people are worried because although this case fatality is 4%, 4% can still add up if you have enough cases, right? So it is worrying from that respect. And um, most likely we're gonna hit a plateau of cases soon. Uh, Estimates aren't sure exactly when that's going to happen, but we are currently in the exponential growth rate of this virus and we'll see uh, how far it spreads before it's under control. If we're either quarantine, isolation, or multiple factors that are currently being implemented. Let's talk about how to avoid the virus and what to look for if you are infected. So the main three symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, dry cough, and fatigue. All right, so these are pretty, um, in non-specific symptoms. A lot of diseases have these symptoms, common cold, the common flu, right? So how are you sure if you have coronavirus associated symptoms or if you have some sort of just regular rhinovirus common cold situation? Well, you can go get tested. Uh, there are testing kits currently being handed out in many hospitals in the United States. These are RT-PCR tests, which are highly specific and highly sensitive for the virus. So the detection rate is very good. And what happens if you uh, have already gotten infected? So let's go through a little bit of a, the clinical timeline on the infection. So day zero, someone coughs in your mouth or uh, you shake hands with someone that's been coughing all day and pick your nose and you get the infection. So up to day three and four, uh, the virus usually starts to establish itself in the oropharynx. So that's uh, what's causing your sore throat symptoms. That's what's gonna happen first. Then the virus starts to move around, goes into the nasal passages, the sinuses, you're gonna get runny nose, a lot of secretions. And finally, it's gonna go into the lungs and cause respiratory distress and respiratory symptoms. So up to, up to day four, you mostly just have a sore throat, runny nose. And then four to seven, somewhere around here, you're gonna have symptoms of pneumonia and maybe a little bit of shortness of breath. Uh, people, after they start getting some more severe symptoms around day seven, will come to the hospital for admission, will get tested and test positive. But up at this point, it's usually a little late because um, the virus has already caused some amount of fibrosis in the lungs. So these people can go into respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And at that point, they require ICU admission and ventilatory support. Um, to help them breathe until the virus uh, resolves and the immune system deals with it. But if you're young and um, under 65, the chances of this are fairly low. So let's go through how to prevent getting the virus. So air droplets and touch are how the virus enters your system. And the three ways it gets in there is through your eyes, nose, and mouth. So don't touch these areas. And if you need to touch these areas, make sure you wash your hands beforehand. Soap and water is totally fine. You don't need alcohol wipes to do this, but uh, I would recommend alcohol wipes for your devices that you touch all the time, like your phone, your keys, your ID badges, things like that. Wipe them down with alcohol. It's just a little extra preventative measure. Next, uh, we have drinking water. Now this is important because it essentially flushes your mouth and your pharynx. Uh, and the more frequently you do this, the better, because let's say you have some viral particles in there, they're gonna go into your stomach instead of your trachea, and the stomach is full of acid, right? And this is an enveloped virus, which is sensitive to acid, alcohol, and high temperatures. So acid's gonna kill it from the stomach. And then last is humid air, and this kind of goes again with the, with the water theory, in that we, if we have humid air, the circulation in the nose and pharynx with the mucus is going to be better. It's not gonna dry up, so the virus is less likely to stick and cause infection. And a lot of questions people have are about these masks. So here's a regular surgical mask and here's an N95 on the right. Um, the regular surgical mask has a bunch of holes here on the side and on the top. So re they're generally uh, recommended for those who've already had the infection just so they're not coughing out and spreading the virus to others. 
And if you want to be protected yourself, the N95 is more superior because it provides a full seal around the mouth and nose and has a filter in there for air. So it's preventing 95% of droplets from entering the mask and getting into your system. But do you really need a mask if you're young and healthy? No, not really. Uh, the virus, if someone's coughing, has only a 10 uh, foot range. So if you're just keeping away from people that are sick, if you're washing your hands and doing these other protective measures, uh, that's more than enough to keep the virus at bay. So we talked about the RT-PCR test for the virus. And now let's say you can't get tested or are still worried that the virus is affecting you negatively. Um, I've read some uh, public health recommendations from Asia that say that you should take a deep breath in and then try to hold it for 10 seconds. And if you can't hold it for 10 seconds, that indicates a lung impairment and you should immediately seek uh, health healthcare workers assistance because the chances of your lung having already started to fibrose has increased. So uh, you could try this exercise if you're really paranoid and it'll help indicate sort of your lung status. So I hope this video was able to help you guys uh, learn a little bit more about what's going on with the current pandemic. And if you have any questions or any comments about the content of this video, please leave a comment in the comment box below and I'll try my best to respond to as many of them as I can. All right, thanks and see you guys in the next video.